اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والحمد للہ رب العالمین بار الخلاق اجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء وسید المرسلین حبیب الہ العالمین المصطفى ابی القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما فصل طالوت بالجنود قال إن الله مبتليكم بنهر فما شرب منه فليس مني فما شرب منه فليس مني ومن لم يطعمه فإنه مني إلا من اغترف غرفة بيده فشربوا منه إلا قليلا منهم فلما جاوزه هو والذين آمنوا معه قالوا لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنوده قال الذين يظنون أنهم ملاق الله كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله والله مع الصابرين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى على محمد وآل محمد This ayah number 249 of Surah Al-Baqarah discusses part of the story of Talut. I will briefly talk about the story. The story is very, very interesting story indeed. It's about two pages approximately in the Holy Quran. It carries a lot of meanings. In fact, about a year ago, I recorded a show, 10 episodes just going over these Two pages, and that was still enough, not enough, you know, still condensing it. So, it's a lot of interesting things in this story and a lot of lessons, but today we'll concentrate on this ayah. Before I get into the ayah, of course, I'll just give a brief history about the story of Talut, who's Talut and everything, but I will not get into much details because of the time. At the time of Musa, alayhi salam, the children of Israel managed to rise again to power. So after the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh perished, the children of Israel, they managed to come back to power. They stayed in power until they started basically disobeying Allah's commands. When people start to disobey Allah's commands, neglect them, start to ridicule, start to ridicule other human beings and not respect them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish those individuals. And this is mentioned, there are many references in the Quran about such instances where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the blessing that Allah bestows upon a community or a group of people unless they change the ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They start abusing the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then a punishment comes. And we read it also in Dua Kumail. Allahumma ghfir liya dhunuba allati tughayyiru al-ni'am, tunzilu al-niqam, or tunzilu al-bala, and so on and so forth. So, what happened is as a consequence of their actions, Allah punished them and again they became weak. You know, at the time of Yusuf, alayhi salam, they rose to power. Then because of their disobedience, they lost power. Pharaoh came back to power or came to power. Then as a consequence to that, then they came back to power. But then they lost it again. And that's because of their disobedience. So sometimes we cannot blame you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our actions. We say, Ya Allah, you know, where is justice? We are believers, we're mu'mineen, we're being punished. And for example, the non-believers, they're not being punished. 
First, let's see, let's judge our actions. What have we done in our lives? Everything we do in our lives will have consequences. And this is really important. We should keep this in mind. Everything we do in life will have consequences. Consequences on dunya and in akhirah. So we make sure that to the best of our abilities, we follow the path of Allah. Then, when that happened, when they became powerless, they came to a prophet of theirs. Quran doesn't mention his name, but according to the ahadith, his name was Shimoil or Ishmael, or in Arabic, Ismail, the translation. So this prophet of theirs by the name of Ismail, they came to him, they told him, bring us a king so that he can lead us back to victory, back to power. The children, the children of one of the brothers of Yusuf by the name of Lawi, his descendants were the prophets. So Musa alayhi salam is of the descendants of Lawi, one of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. And so was Ismail. He was of the descendants of Lawi. So the children of Lawi, this brother of Yusuf, his lineage had the prophethood. The descendants of Yusuf had the power, the leadership. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses for them who? Talut. Talut comes. They say, what is this? Talut? Who is this man? We don't know who, we don't know who he is. Their prophet said, Ismail, he told them, well, you guys wanted a king, and Allah has chosen a king. And what else do you want? They started complaining. Why? Because he was not of the children of Yusuf, nor was he of the children of Lawi. He was of the descendants of Binyamin, Yusuf's brother. So Talut was one of the descendants of Binyamin. So they protested, they objected. Why him? He does not come from a rich class. You know, the class is not a rich class. Nor is it the class of prophethood. Who is this guy? Nonetheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet to respond to them that Allah chose him. So he has certain characteristics and features that will make him fit for this task. What are they? We don't have time to get into them now. Did they agree? No. They said, we want proof. We want proof. You know, just like they told Musa alayhi salam. You know, Musa told them, Allah commands you to sacrifice a cow. He said, what cow? Bring us proof. You know, so he had to bring them proof. Tell them which cow. It becomes detailed. It becomes specific. Although the hadith says, had they slaughtered any cow, it would have done the job. Because Allah told them, you know, Musa alayhi salam told them, that in Allah ya'murukum an tadbahu baqara. Allah commanded to slaughter a cow, a cow, anyone. But they said, which one, what color, what looking, everything. So they became more specific. Nonetheless, here as well, they want, we want a sign. So their prophet said, okay, there will be a sign. And indeed a sign came. What is the sign again? Because of the time, we don't have much time to get into it. But there was a sign, so people agreed. Finally, Talut is the leader. Okay. So now, Talut is the leader. Talut comes to them and he says, he was a man who was strong, tall. He told them, now we need to get ready. There is a king, a tyrant king, an oppressive king by the name of Jalut. So Jalut is the evil individual. We need to fight against him. Now Jalut has the power, he's got the strength, he's got the military. We need to fight him. So let's get ready. Who will come with me? Many people came, although a few individuals still, you know, they, they couldn't digest the fact that Talut is, is the leader. You know, they just, they can't take it. It's too difficult for them. And we see it happening. We see it happening even after the Prophet's death. After our Prophet's death, some people could not digest having Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, as the Khalifa. They just couldn't, couldn't take it. You know, it was too difficult for them to accept that, that fact. So they pushed him aside. Nonetheless, he took the army, he took the people with him. Now he wanted to see how genuine is his, is his army, this people. How genuine are they? How sincere are they? You know, normally when it comes to numbers and words, it's easy. You tell people, for example, we want to establish you know, a program, we want to have a program. People say, yes, yes, we'll help you, we'll help you. 
And then at the time of the execution, mashallah, a person is left like Muslim in Kufa. You know, nobody is. All by himself. You tell people, we want, for example, to build a school. That's a great project. We'll help, we'll help. At the time of execution, everybody is gone. Khalas. All alone. You know, people were with Imam al-Hasan, alayhi salam. People with Imam al-Hasan. But then they left him all alone, you know, all by himself. So, we'll come to that, inshallah, shortly. So we'll be with you, we'll be with you. They go, he wanted to test to make sure who's with him and who's not with him. So what is the test? When he leaves the city that they're from, they start heading towards the army of Jalut, this oppressive tyrant king. They approach him on the way to Jalut, to fighting him. It was a hot day, they were really thirsty, they start to sweat. They came across a river. And that's when he spoke. And this is what the ayah that we will be discussing. So what is the test? فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ فَصَلَ means he moved. He moved at a distance from wherever he was. So they started migrating. We started moving. Not migrating, moving. فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ The leader. بِالْجُنُودِ Junood means what? The army. His army. His army. قَالْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَرِ Allah is testing you with what? A nahar. What's a nahar? A river. A hot day. Summer. People are sweating. This is your test. I want to see which one of you is genuine. How many of you are genuine? So they come and they say there is a river right here. Cold, fresh, running water right in the front of you. Now what is it? What is the test? فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Anyone who drinks from this river is not of me. He's not of me. لَيْسَ مِنِّي He's not of me anymore. That's it. And then what else? وَمَنْ لَمْ يَطْعَمْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Anyone who does not taste it, does not even taste it, is of me. See, you see? So the group that will drink, they are not of me. Anyone who does not even taste it, he is of me. And then there's a third group. Except for a person who dips his hand. And there is differences in the opinion. Whether just dips the hand to cool himself or whether to take a little bit of you know, a little bit. Just kind of to, let's say, taste the water. Taste it. But not really drink. You know. Either way. So apparently, there seems to be three groups. One group that will jump into the river and start drinking. What, is, what, is, what are you talking about? You know, test, what test? Forget this, you know, let's go. Mashallah, it's hot. Let's dump, take a swim in this river. And they take and drink, mashallah, from it. Another group, they say, you know what? This is too difficult to resist. So let us at least cool ourselves with it. Let us dip our hands with it. You know, we won't drink from it. Or at least we won't quench our thirst with it. But we'll just dip it, you know. A third group said, no. We will not even touch it. The third group, Talud said, those individuals are of me. Minni. That group. The first group is not even with me. So, what happened then? What was the consequence? فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُ They drank from it except a few. You know the interesting thing, brothers and sisters? It is said in the traditions when he left Talut, when he left with the army, there were 60,000 people with him. 60,000. After this test, the people who did not drink or only dipped their hands into it were a total of 313 individuals, according to the Ruayat, equivalent to the numbers who fought in the battle of Badr, the fighters of Badr, according to the Ahadith. So out of 60,000, when they funneled it down, it was only 313 individuals. And those 313, not all of them are of him. Not all of them are of him. Fewer 
were of them, of him. The ones who did not even touch the water. We were less than 313. But he gave permission. Those who touched the water, or let's say tasted the water, those, he gave them permission to stay with him. The rest, no. He told them, خلص. If you can't even resist your temptations for drinking and quenching your thirst, how will you risk the temptation of staying alive? That's even greater than if you tell somebody who's thirsty, either you drink or I'm going to kill you. Like, you know, what would you, choose? what would you choose? Stay thirsty or die? I'll tell you, definitely I'll stay thirsty. I'd rather stay thirsty than losing my life. You know, maybe I, next time I will drink. If someone cannot even resist thirst, how is he willing to give up his life? So he said no. They said no, and many of them failed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues with the story. So when he passed the river, him and those who believed with him, they said, لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجالوت وجنوده. We cannot fight Jalut and his army. It's too many people. This is a huge army, and we're only 313. Then there came an answer. Now, who said this? Apparently, apparently, those who dipped their hands into the river or those who tasted the water, they're the ones who said this. So the action of them dipping their hands into the water had a consequence on their iman. On their iman, it had a consequence. It, shake, it shook their iman a little bit. Their iman was not as solid anymore because they dipped their hands. Even though they did not, like you know, the first group, completely drink, but they still, they were not as solid and strong as the third group. So they said, Jalut, a huge army, we can't fight him. The response came from the third group, the group that is of him. قالوا, قال الذين يظنون أنهم ملاق الله. Those who realize and recognize that they will be meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day they'll see Allah, they'll, 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 they'll die in this dunya. What do they respond? كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله. How many times a small group defeats a large group by the permission and the will of Allah سبحانه وتعالى بإذن الله. والله مع الصابرين and Allah is with the patient ones. So don't be worried. Don't be afraid of this huge army. A huge army doesn't make sense, you know, does, that should not scare you. Many times a small army can defeat a big one. You shouldn't be worried. What are you worried about? And indeed, they met them, 313 individuals. One of the people, one of the fighters, just, just to complete the story and they will come back inshallah. One of the fighters in Talut's army was Prophet Dawood alayhi salam, David. He was one of the fighters in the army. So he takes a couple of rocks on the day when they meet Jalut, the armies meet. He comes and he was a strong fighter. Although he was very young at the time. Dawood salam was very young at the time. He came and he said, where is Jalut? Where is Jalut? They, they point him, they say there, far away. That's him. So he takes this rock, he puts it in some sort of a, a cloth or a fabric that is used for throwing rocks. And he aims it at him, the rock falls right on Jalut's head and kills him. And Jalut gets killed and dies. His army, although they were huge, the minute they saw their leader has just been killed. So it had a psychological impact on the whole army. Their leader is just killed. خلص. So the whole army disintegrated. The whole army. And they were all defeated. And people started cheering Dawood السلام, And then he became basically a Khalifa. He became a leader. He became a political leader. As well as a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this leadership that was, was then passed to Sulaiman السلام. Sulaiman also became a leader as well. So this is a brief story of Talut 
and Jalut. Very briefly, of course. Now, the interesting thing is this ayah that we mentioned, this Nahar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the people of Talut with a river. And they were divided into three groups. One group that disobeyed, neglected. One group that, no, was very strong and solid. And one group in the middle. In the middle. Now, on the day of Ashura, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, Zuhair gave a lecture by the permission of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He asked Imam Hussein for permission. Imam Hussein gave him a permission. He turned to the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad and he told them, إن الله ابتلانا وإياكم بذرية نبيه محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على محمد لينظر ما نحن وإياكم فاعلون وإنا ندعوكم لنصرتهم وخذلان الطاغي عبيد الله بن زياد He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us with who? With what? This time is not a river, but this time is the progeny of his prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. The progeny. This is our test. To see what will we do with this test. So here we are calling you to support them, to help them, to sacrifice your lives for them. And to let go of Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad, that tyrant, oppressive king and ruler and leader. Leave him. Come to our camp. Don't go to the camp of Jalut. Come to the camp of Talut. Or the people who go on the path of Talut. But people, of course, shot him with arrows. Shot him with arrows. And Imam Hussein sent a messenger who called him. He said, Ya Zuhair, Imam Hussein alayhi salam is calling you. And he says, You are equivalent to Mu'mini Ali Fir'aun. You know the story, the believer from Ali Fir'aun, which is mentioned in Surah Ghafir. One of the people, the cousin of Fir'aun, the cousin of Fir'aun, his name was Hizqil. He was a believer, he was a Mu'min. You know? And he started admonishing his people. Fir'aun and his people. He started admonishing them to follow Musa alayhi salam. So the messenger of Imam Hussein came and told him, told him, Ya Zuhair, Imam Hussein is calling you back. He says, it's enough. You have suffice just like Mu'min Ali Fir'aun. He also admonished his people. And now you've admonished your people. So come back. So he, he returns to the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Brothers and sisters, just like Zuhair ibn al-Qayn said, Allah is testing us, and now it is us, let's say the believers, with his progeny, with his, the progeny of, the progeny of his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. How do we respond to the progeny of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? How do we deal with them? What is our relationship with them? That is something important. Many people claim that they love them. We also say we love Ahl al-Bayt. 60,000 people left with Talut. Out of the 60,000, how many were left? 313. 313. So where do we fit in that equation? Where are we? You know, we read in the day of on, on the Ziyarah, فَيَا لَيْتَنَا كُنَّا مَعَكُمْ فَنَفُوزَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا Right? We wish. Imam Hussein went on the way to Karbala. He stopped at a place where he met a man by the name of Abdullah or Ubaidillah ibn al-Hur al-Ju'fi. He told him, Ya Abdullah, why don't you join my camp? Ubaidillah or Abdullah ibn al-Hur said, Ya Aba Abdullah, I cannot, I can't fight. I don't, I, I, I'm not ready to die. I'm not ready to die. He said, but I have a horse. This horse is very fast. Any enemy I can reach, I can reach him with this horse. 
So I will donate him to you. I give a donation. Take him. Imam Hussein said, I don't need your horse. We don't need your horse. We need you. If you're not willing to support us, what shall we do with your horse? Take it and go. And he did not support Imam Hussein. And you know what? It is said in the books of history, this man was the first man to come to the grave of Imam Hussein. The first person to do ziyarah of Imam Hussein's grave was this man, Ubaidullah ibn al hur al-Ju'fi. He came and he started crying, weeping. And there are very famous verses of poetry that he started reciting on the grave of Imam Hussein, saying, how could I, how could I reject the offer of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? I wish I fought with him and then I would have achieved the highest honor. I would have achieved the highest degree of honor. So, are we like him? This man saw Imam Hussein, listened to Imam Hussein, heard Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein invited him, but didn't come. And look at the rahmah, the mercy of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein told him, if that's what you choose to do, then at least go from away to, to a place far away from Karbala. Because anyone who hears my call, Imam al-Nasirin yansuruna, and does not respond, he will not go to Jannah. So leave, leave. Look at the mercy of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. A man who says, I will not help you. You know, when we read in the Quran about the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, where Allah tells him, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Really, Ahl al-Bayt are also rahmatan lil alameen. They're also a mercy to this universe. Even with a man who rejects his offer, his assistance, Imam Hussain tells him, at least go far away. Don't listen to my cry and my shout. Now, how are we with Imam Hussain? And how are we with Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hassan, today I was reading, you know, his, his the letter when he signed the treaty with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Today, really when you read it, you start feeling the pain in your heart. He says, this is the, you know, part of what he said after mentioning Allah's name. He says, this is a treaty between Al-Hasan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Now just to have those two names on the same paper, well, Allah brings pain to the heart. Where is Imam Hassan and where is Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan? But... And then he says, we're giving the wilaya of Muslimin, you know, the leadership of the Muslims is being passed to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. I'm just thinking, you know, you think it was easy for Imam al-Hassan to write this or to dictate this? Very difficult, very painful. But what can he do? He went, in fact, camped into a place where he told people, he wanted to prove to people that they are disobeying him. He told people, we're going to go and fight Muawiyah, come with me. Only 4,000 people show up, only 4,000. Imam could not fight with 4,000. He's the Khalifa of the Muslims, he's the Khalifa. If he gets killed, he'll be killed as the Khalifa of the Muslims. Imam did not want that to happen. His own cousin, Imam's cousin, Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas. Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas was Imam Ali's governor in Yemen. Muawiyah sends an army to Yemen. Ubaidullah runs away. Runs away. Muawiyah's army kills his two sons. He had two boys. They killed them. But then, times change. Imam Hassan make him the head of the army, of his army, with 12,000 men. 12,000 men under the commandership of Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas. This is not to be confused with Abdullah ibn al-Abbas, huh? Just, Abdullah was, was good. He did not betray the Imam, Abdullah ibn al-Abbas. But his brother, Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas, Imam's cousin. Muawiyah then tells him, you come switch sides, come to my camp, and I'll give you thousands, thousands. And he accepts, can you believe it? A man who killed his own son, his own son. He switched sides. You know, sometimes... When you're left with such people, what can you do? A man who is his own cousin and a man whose sons have been killed by this man. How can you trust such a man who killed your own sons? But subhanAllah, sometimes people, when it comes to money, when it comes to interests, 
They leave everything aside. They leave Imam al-Hassan aside. They leave and leave. They come and shake hands with the man who killed their own children. That's interest. Interest. So brothers and sisters, we have to be careful. Where do we fit there in this equation? So how do we show the, oh, this test? How do we make sure we pass? One, there are several things. We'll mention a few of them. One, attending the majalis of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam, can help us pass this test, inshallah. You know, sometimes the weather is cold. Sometimes maybe even too hot sometimes. But people should attend the majalis of Ahlul Bayt. Attend and listen to them. Be their guests. That is a sign of respecting them. Second is respecting the servants of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam, those who serve Ahlul Bayt. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Allahum sallallahu With regards to respecting also the children of Rasulullah, respecting the children of Rasulullah, Sayyids. The Prophet said, honor my progeny, the pious ones and the non-pious ones. The pious ones, honor them for the sake of Allah. The non-pious ones, honor them for my sake. For my sake. So when he saw people were surprised, how can we honor the non-pious ones? So if we say Sayyid who's doing something wrong, he said, well, even if he is a bad son, but still he's a son. You know, God forbid if someone gives somebody a bad son, after all, he carries the same name. The last name is the same name. You know, you can't disassociate yourself. From that name. But he said, honor them for me, for my sake. You know, sometimes, same thing with the servants of Imam Hussein, brothers and sisters. Honor the servants of Imam Hussein. Sometimes we might come, someone might cook for the sake of Imam Hussein, and people are complaining, oh, this food is too hot, this food is too cold, this food doesn't taste well. This man is serving Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. I have respect at least for the servant of Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. You know, if you have a friend who, for example, when you needed a transplant, God forbid, God forbid, someone needs a transplant, and you have a friend who says, I will transplant, I'll give you the transplant, I'll give you the kidney, or I'll give you the liver, and you, you're saved. Then after, let's say, five years, ten years, this friend of yours who saved your life, I mean, how much in debt you'll be in to do this man? If this friend of yours calls you after five years and says, I have my son who will be visiting your city, can you please take care of him? Say, oh, of, course, of course, the son comes. Now, the son is not a very good man. Maybe he's not very polite. He's disrespectful. But what will you do? Will you kick him out? No. You say, for the sake of his father, you know, his father saved my life, even though the son is disrespectful. But his father has done me such huge favors. So I will take care of him. You know, I'll take care of him. This is a friend who gave you a transplant, who saved your body, what about Ahlul Bayt who sacrificed their whole lives? Imam Hussein who sacrificed his life for us. What about his servants? We should honor the servants of Imam Hussein. Never talk anything bad about any of the servants of Imam Hussein. Of course, unless, you know, some cook, for example, who puts poison in the food, you know, this is, this is a different story. If someone comes to talk, like, you know, the speakers of, of, of Bani Umayyah who would curse Ahlul Bayt, who poison people's minds, no, but if somebody who is trying to spread the message of Ahlul Bayt, make people cry for Ahlul Bayt, serving Imam Hussein alayhi salam, we should honor them. We should not disrespect them. Anyone who serves Ahlul Bayt, we should honor them. It is said one day there was in the city of Tabriz in Iran, on the day of Ashura, they use, on maybe even now, they go on the streets. They do basically a procession on the street where they beat their chest and they walk and cry for Imam Hussein. One man, he says, as we were walking, I saw there was a young man, a youth, a young man, and he was really handsome looking. I noticed his eyes looking at the ladies. You know, there was ladies. So, so I became very upset. You know, what is this guy? He's in the Ma'atam of Imam Hussein, and he's looking at the ladies. So he goes, and he, mashallah, slaps him. Like, you know, mashallah. Like, you know, some, some of our people, mashallah, you know. He says... Then I felt pain in my hand. I felt a pain in my arm. I went to the doctor. I told him there's pain in my arm. He gave me some medication. Nothing helped. Nothing helped. Then I went to sleep. 
In the dream, I saw, I heard a voice that told me, today you disrespected one of the people in my majlis, in my aza. Your hand will not be cured unless you take his forgiveness. So the man woke up, ran to this young man, apologized to him. He said, no, I forgive you. No problem. I forgive you. And he forgave him. He said, then my hand started feeling better. He said, maybe I did so often in this man. Maybe he was looking at maybe his, his sister, his wife. So we cannot disrespect the followers of Ahlul Bayt. We should try to attend the majalis of Ahlul Bayt, respect the majalis of Ahlul Bayt, respect the servants of Ahlul Bayt, the children of Ahlul Bayt. Allah is testing us with Ahlul Bayt. And what is our response? How do we fare? How do we fare? Do we become among those people who don't pay their allegiance and drink from the water? Or shall we be among those, inshallah, who don't drink and be solid and steadfast? That's what Ahl al-Bayt want of us. How much do we give? Finally, brothers and sisters, let us try to donate for the majalis of Ahl al-Bayt. Donate. Give. To the best of your ability. In the name of Ahl al-Bayt. For Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim as -salam. It is said in the books of history that when the camp of Imam Hussein moved from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham, on the way, when they left Kufa, on their way to Sham, they stopped at a place next to a church. There was a church, and next to it, there, they stopped. They kept the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the spear next to that church. At night, the priest who used to reside in that church, he came out, he looked from his window, he saw there is noor, there is light. From the spear, that light is reaching the skies. So he comes out of his church and he approaches the people. He tells them, who's, who's this? Whose head is this? They tell him this is the head of Al Hussein ibn Fatima bin to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah. They said he said, This is the head of your Prophet's grandson? They said, Yes, our Prophet's grandson. He said, if our Prophet had a grandson, we would engulf him and protect him with our lives, not kill him. And then he told them, listen to this. He told them. I have inherited from my father 10,000 dirhams. It means 10,000 silver coins. How about I give you these 10,000 silver coins? In exchange, you give me the head for one night. One night. This night, you give me this head. I'll keep it with me. Tomorrow, I'll give it back. In exchange of 10,000 dirhams. This is all he had. This is all he had and it was inheritance money. How much are we willing to give to Imam Hussein alayhi salam? How much are we willing to give Imam Hussein? Some of us, unfortunately, don't even want to give a dollar for the sake of Imam Hussein. These projects, they require the money, the help of the mu'mineen. These programs require money, help of mu'mineen. They saw 10,000 dirhams, 10,000 silver coins. They said, give, sure, take the head. He took the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, went inside. He washed the face and the head of Imam Hussein with water. He removed all the blood and the stains of the blood. Then he perfumed the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And he spent the night with the head on his chest, on his lap. Crying and crying and crying until the morning came. When the morning came, he looked at the head. He said, oh head, I have nothing else to give for you. I gave everything I have. But there is only one thing I have, which is myself 
And for that, I will say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa anna jaddaka Muhammad rasulullah I believe in you, and I believe in your grandfather Rasulullah. A man who has this face, obviously he's a divine man. And he takes the head and gives it back to these people. This church, after some time, was bought by some mu'mineen and was converted into a shrine. Now people go in Aleppo, in Halab, and they visit that place. They visit it. Where this priest washed the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam is still there. The stone is still there. If you go to Halab, Aleppo, in northern Syria, you'll see now millions of people go for the ziyara. That's when a man donates for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He donated whatever he had and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept that. And his story is mentioned. This priest and the head of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So brothers and sisters, let us try to aim to serve the majalis of Ahlul Bayt. In two days time, we have the wafat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the martyrdom of Imam al rida alayhi salam. After that, we have the wafat of Ma'suma. After that, the wafat of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. So all these occasions are coming. Let us put in the effort to attend participate such that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are the sincere followers of Ahlul Bayt we don't want to be among those 60,000 who are saying yes 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 labbayka ya Hussein labbayka ya Hussein and then when the time comes we run away we want to be among the 313 inshallah and then there is another 313 and those are the commanders of the imams army ajalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif we want to be among those, insha'Allah, or at least in the army of the Imam. That requires work. Let's raise our hands for the du'a, mu'mineen and mu'minat, such that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our du'a and make us among the sincere followers of Ahl al-Bayt. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Amma yujibul مضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر 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 إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا يا الله كفر عنا سيئاتنا يا الله وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات يا الله على الخصوص من أوصانا بالدعاء اقض حوائجهم شافي مرضاهم ارحمهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربيان صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء 
اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحا وقائدا ونا ودليلا وعي حتى تسكنه أرضك طوى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إلي اللهم بحق الزهراء فاطمة ارزقنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص أموات الجالسين والحاضرين إلى أرواحهم رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله